lecture, we recovered all the software options, so the screen is shared, and I think we are heard outside as well, so we can, we can start the lecture. During the previous lecture, the, the conclusion usually <coughs> where that we have a firm theory and we understand Keplerian disk, etc. Now we slowly enter parts of the lecture with conclusions which will be quite different. But step by step, today we will start talking about two-phase medium to face media because accreting sources are much more complex than just the simple accretion disks and that was already mentioned before. On the other hand, two face media is a very difficult problem physically. Even in the laboratory, if you study Forms, for example, this is still a very, very complex uh, thing. But of course, in, in, in nature, almost everywhere we, we look, we have a, a kind of uh, two phase medium. Well, uh, the air and the table, it's also a kind of two phase medium, although it's quite, quite obvious. But uh, oh, uh, clouds, for example, uh, if we look at uh, things which are kind of uniform, like water, right? We, because the, the, the difference between table and air is, is kind of obvious, it's different uh, chemical composition. But in the case of, of uh, water, you also know that you can have uh, actually three types of uh, water form, right? Solid state, liquid, and and the gas and those those fo fo forms can coexist so usually uh, liquid and gas water can coexist or liquid and solid state there, there is just one point one value of pressure and temperature where all three forms are actually in equilibrium And as you can see here, there is additional line which shows that if you overcool water, you can have water even here. So that shows you that everything is very, very, very complicated. But nevertheless, we have to face this issue. Well, there are a few more examples there will be more formula later on but you know at least at the beginning you can you can enjoy uh, some nice uh, figures here this is the, the surface of the water with some droplets and bubbles of air inside here droplets of water and the kind of very complex boundary between water and and air This is also quite uh, interesting. This is uh, uh, the border of US, if you can recognize, right? And this is Atlantic. You see that, right? This is what Florida. Yeah. I'm not good in geography, but I, I guess this is this is Florida. And this is the temperature. You can see here the Gulf Stream. Gulf, Gulf Stream, that's the pro proper pronunciation. So there is a narrow, relatively narrow stream of hot water wandering towards Europe. And this is really very important for the European climate. Otherwise, here in Warsaw, we would have a climate like in, in, in Canada, for example, or in Siberia. We are happy we don't have it. So you see, this water does not totally mix. Somehow, it, 
a difference in temperature, a bit of a difference in uh, salt content, but nevertheless, it's really amazing that the stream is relatively narrow, 100 kilometers wide, shallow, and flows very fast. And it does not completely mix. It should be kind of natural that this water mixes like here, but here it does not. It's not that anybody can model this. It can be studied using satellites, right? So in the case of, of astronomy, because we have to, to, to concentrate on astronomy, of course, you also have uh, two-phase media. And I will start with, with the sun, because this is our closest uh, star. And later, this uh, idea of corona will be used in the case of accreting sources. Of course, sun is not an accreting source, but source. But nevertheless, if you observe sun in the optical band, this is just the standard photo of the sun. This is you you see the the, the optical emission. But if you if you look at the sun in X rays or in UV, for example, or during the the, the solar eclipse, you will see solar corona. So then. Sun looks completely different. Here it looks very quiet, right? Just round shape of the star, and here you see the, the, stel the position of the photosphere. But here you see a lot of emission from the from the corona, a lot of, of bursts. Burst. Here, for example, there is one of those protuberances, and it's really huge. This is the this is an actual photo, it's not uh, a picture. This is from Solar Dynamic Observatory. And this is the size of the Earth to scale. So you see this huge pattern. We don't really have full understanding how it's happening, although they have excellent data. They have the best data for any corona ever. In, a, in, in a studying distant sources, we can dream about this, having this kind of data, and still they don't quite know what is happening, right? On the other hand, in the case of the uh, sun, all what is happening here is not that important unless the, the, the ejection from, from the sun really hits uh, Earth, and then it might look like a problem, but that's a digression. Basically, if you look at the uh, broadband spectrum of the sun, only here it is a wavelength, not a frequency. So I usually draw the other way around. So this is the complete shape of the spectrum. This is the black body, and you see here dashed line, which gives the black body emission at 5,700 kelvins. So this is a very good approximation in this part. If we go to UV part, it's a bit worse. And then here you see all this X-ray UV emission I mentioned before. So this is more or less two, three orders of magnitude below the peak of the emission. So volumetrically, it depends whether the sun is quiet or, or very active, but the, this difficult to model emission is always well, well below 1% of the volumetric luminosity. So in the case of sun, it's interesting, but it's not really that's important. But in the case of other sources, for example, active galactic nuclei, those additional problems are important because this, the broadband spectrum, for example, we will start with active galactic nuclei because, uh, uh, okay. because there the separation of different components is easier. So this is this broadband spectrum, 
in new and new diagram logarithmic this is logarithmic uh, frequency and this optical uv part is really well modeled by the accretion disk i showed that during the previous lecture but nevertheless we have two humps here infrared hump some radio emission and this radio emission actually is present both in radio quiet and radio load sources only in radio load sources it is stronger in radio quiet sources it is fainter but it's always not that important well, most in most cases it's not that important and then you have an x-ray component so that looks like solar corona. The problem is that uh, the amount of emission in this part can be quite high. So we have those two additional components and we can well model and understand only this part and this energy is dissipated as I argued very close to the black hole more or less half of the energy is dissipated at a distance not larger than 10 Schwarzschild radii. Now we will concentrate on that part. But first let's uh, comment on, on this infrared emission and dusty torus. If we are interested in what is happening close to the black hole, we don't have to worry about the infrared emission. Because how this infrared emission forms? This is how we actually imagine that uh, uh, active nucleus looks like. We have a black hole here. We have an accretion disk here. We have some clouds. They are not so important at this moment. So either we have a jet or not. In most uh, cases are, uh, during this lecture, I will concentrate on radio quiet sources. And then we have some kind of dusty molecular torus, which is quite geometrically thick. So this torus intercepts a fraction of radiation which is dissipated here. Because this is uh, quite far and this is mostly dusty, then it means that the temperature of this medium is well below 1000 Kelvin. And then the ray emission is in the infrared. And this is this infrared hump or three micron hump or whatever. So we know how it happens. It's just reprocessing of this radiation. It can be up to 30%. So it's not noticeable, but it is a kind of secondary uh, phenomenon. And we know that the location of the torus from the measurements of the time delay. So for several uh, examples, uh, people were able to measure the time delay between the variability of the continuum and the variability of the infrared emission. So this, this torus is more distant, more or less by a factor of five, than those clouds, and those clouds are of course much more distant than the innermost part of the torus. So that part happens very far from the nucleus. Yes, question? Curiosity, is, um, is there a correlation between the presence of jet and the black hole spin? Good question. People dis still discuss that. There are many people would argue that there is, but observationally we don't have 100% proof, and that's a pity because that causes a problem of uh, source of energy for the jet. Mm -hmm. Because if it is blunt for Znajek, we need high spin. Mm -hmm. But it's not really 100% proven. So for the dusty bump from the previous picture, this is not a problem and we will forget about it. Now what about this one? This X-ray image. There is one hint which comes uh, easily from the uh, light caps. I mentioned to you already several times that AGNs are always varying. So here is the light curve in X-rays, 2 to 10 kV. 
Here, this is optical light curve, the, the red color. What you see here is a lot of complex structures. That means that the variability is fast. Variability is fast. Also, amplitude of the variability is, is large. So that is immediately suggested that the X-ray emitting region is very compact. It's not 100% proof, but it is suggested. Because if you have small region, as we discussed, uh, for example, constraints which come from efficiency, then the size of the region determines the time scale. So X-rays should come from things which is very compact. So now, uh, let us look at uh, spectra, exemplary spectra of uh, galactic sources. I showed you this plot before, but in that, in previous, on previous occasion, I showed you that the, that the X-ray emission in binary sources sometimes really looks like a black ball. Right, this would be more or less a black box. But now I tell you that there are other states <coughs> where this is really not like a black box. No way that this can be interpreted as a black box. But nevertheless, most of the energy now is in that component. So that has to be very close to the black hole. And we will talk about it more. On the other hand, multi-phase medium can also exist at larger distances. Because, you know, it's really quite the generic property. And this is an example of the light curve quite oldish one, still from Exosat, of the source which uh, uh, has a nice name, Dick Dipper. That's a binary system, highly inclined. So it shows eclipses. So if you are outside the eclipse, the source is bright and nothing much happens. And then you enter the eclipse. And here you are inside the eclipse. But before you enter the eclipse, it shows a lot of rapid, very deep absorptions. So that shows you that the outer rim of the, of the disk is quite clumpy. And this is why the, the, the source was named, named Big Deeper, because it shows really most spectacular dips. So, Clumps of cold material embedded actually in the hot medium can exist at larger distances. Mm. So this is just different setup, different mm, example of uh, things. And of course, in AGNs, we also uh, have cooler clumps inside the hotter medium, and this will be the broad line region. But now we will concentrate mostly on that part. Because here, most of the energy is in the form of X-rays, and this does not look thermal. And this is the same shape, more or less, if you look at it. Oops. Then I schematically showed in AGN, right? It's the same complex. So now to, to understand that, we have to study some physics, how actually X-ray emission forms in nature. Of course, you need some hot 
plasma because if you don't have hot plasma, you do not expect uh, X-ray emission. And in the case of solar corona, you know that the temperature of the solar corona is something like one to two millions of, of uh, kelvins. On the other hand, uh, when you look here at this plot, you see that this emission more or less goes to 100 kg, which corresponds to 10 to 9 kelvins. And when we talked about spherical accretion and maximum energy attained by particle, that was during the first or second lecture, then I argued that this temperature should be 10 to 12. It's not 10 to 12, it's three orders of magnitude lower. So what is here obviously important is not mostly heating, but cooling, which has to be very, very efficient to push the temperature lower by three orders of magnitude than expected from naive arguments. But let's talk shortly about uh, emission processes. So the first uh, uh, obvious uh, mechanism of, of emission is uh, thermal emission from plasma, like in the case of solar corona, this is the dominating uh, uh, emission. Uh, you can call it free-free or bremsstrahlung, depends on, I think, Europe uses bremsstrahlung, US uses, I think, free-free uh, uh, emission. How such an, mm, emission forms? You have an ion at rest, and then you have ionized medium, so you have electrons running here and there. If this is thermal plasma, then the energy of ion is the same as energy of electron, kinetic energy. And because ion is massive, then ion is slow. So it's mostly at rest, while small electron is running all over the place and occasionally it finds itself close to, to ion and interacts by Coulomb forces and changes the trajectory. And the change of trajectory leads to emission of electromagnetic wave or uh, photons. To derive this formula is not really very simple, so I, I, I decided not to try to do that with you. But the formula for, for the Bremsstrahlung as a function of uh, frequency of the emitted photons, photons has a simple shape. It, it depends mm -hmm. in a quadratic form on the, on the density, because if you have more ions and more electrons, you have more emission, of course. And the dependence on, on uh, frequency actually enters into this exponential term here. Here also temperature appears and here temperature appears. So for the spectrum, this emission looks like this. If you plot here F nu, but not, not nu F nu, F nu, then this Bremsstrahlung is quite flat till you get with photon energies to the mm, more or less to the mean energy of electrons, and then you drop because there are not enough uh, energetic electrons to, to produce uh, photons, which would be uh, that fast. If you need just the efficiency of, of uh, cooling of the plasma, you can integrate this emissivity over the frequency. So then you have a formula which is frequency independent, but then you have an explicit dependence on the temperature and with this slow dependence, just square root of the, of the temperature. But it rises with, with the temperature. On the other hand, if we look at the previous plot, does this solve our problem? And the answer immediately is no. 
because if this is flat on mu f nu on nu then on mu f nu the slope on log log should be plus one on the other hand if you look here at this plot here again this here you have two orders of magnitude between one and 100 and here <coughs> you have less than an order of magnitude. So branch slalom would give you a slope like this. So this is not a branch slalom. The next uh, uh, mechanism is synchrotron, uh, cyclotron or uh, synchrotron emission. And this is the uh, characteristic for uh, jet sources because it requires strong uh, magnetic uh, field. If the uh, if electrons are not uh, highly relativistic, then actually you see cyclotron emission with characteristic frequencies, and that's not very frequent. But in few sources uh, uh, containing neutron stars, you see cyclotron lines, and you can determine the uh, properties of the neutron star using the uh, redshift of the cyclotron uh, emission line. In the case of uh, AGN, you see synchrotron emission from, from jets. And for example, in this M87, I, I already showed this plot. So this is broadband spectrum of M87, this famous source, which is now resolved. You do not see the, the disk component. It should be somewhere here. It's not. But you see here a bump which is due to synchrotron emission and that comes from relativistic uh, electrons which have a power law distribution and that's the result of acceleration in shocks. And we will talk a bit about that but not during this lecture when we talk about uh, jets. <coughs> But this synchrotron emission is basically a uh, millimeter optical, whatever. It hardly goes to X-rays, but only in BL lag sources. So it's not what we are looking for. So now Compton process, and this is indeed the process which is responsible for the emission of radio quiet sources, both in galactic sources and in, in AGN. So first example is just elastic Thomson scattering and we were talking about it already when we defined the Eddington luminosity, right? You have uh, radiation, you have electron and the electron is initially at rest, photon gets scattered Previously, we needed that to calculate the force. Now we are just interested in the process. But during the elastic uh, scattering, all you do is just you change the direction of the photon, but you do not change the energy of the photon. It's on the other hand uh, important to, to note that actually the probability of the di photon direction is not really uniform. Normally we use the Thomson cross section which is independent on the direction. And this is this sigma t which we were using before during the second lecture. But if you look more carefully, then actually the uh, probability depends on this value of theta. So it's larger probability for photon to go forward or backward and less probability in the perpendicular direction. But it's not a huge difference because it is one plus cosine. So it's cosine squared, right? So it's one plus zero or one plus one factor two. So we can normally skip that, not a problem. But el elastic scattering just changes the direction so it does not form you the spectrum. On the other hand, if we have this, the same collision, we should actually think about 
conservation of energy and momentum. When we said that uh, photons go, got scattered, electrons remained motionless, then, then we, we cheated, right? Because we did not conserve the momentum, for example, and energy as well. So in principle, you should really consider this phenomenon as the uh, scattering of two balls, whatever, if somebody plays snooker, then it's known exercise, right? You scatter one ball against the, 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 the other. This is uh, quite complicated and it's uh, better to use uh, special relativity. It's actually quite important to use special relativity for that purpose. And you have to work hard to uh, put all equations. So the energy equation is apparently simple. It's just the photon plus electron before the scattering is equal electron plus photon after scattering. The momentum has to include the information about the direction. So you have to study separately the dire direction, momentum perpendicular to the initial direction of photon and uh, parallel to the initial uh, direction of the photon. Here we always assume that electron is at rest before the scattering, but later, of course, the electron will have to go in this uh, direction. So as I said, it's uh, uh, actually very important to use relativistic expression for the energy of uh, an electron. And this is the general form of the relativistic uh, uh, energy. After scattering here, you have the uh, momentum of the photon, uh, of the electron after scattering. Before that, you have only MEC squared. This is the rest mass because the velocity is zero. So if you work quite carefully through those conservation equations, then you will get the equation for the final energy of the photon after the scattering. And this is what we wanted to have. So this is E gamma is the energy before the uh, scattering and E gamma prime is after scattering. So as you see, it depends on the cosine theta, which is here between this direction. But, oops. but it also contains this MEC square factor, which came from the rest mass energy of the electron. If you look at this formula, it's not quite obvious what it tells you, right? It's very complicated, but it's exact. On the other hand, you can do two things. First, instead of using energy, you can uh, use the wavelength of the photon. It's not a problem, right? You know that energy is equal to uh, Planck constant times frequency, and then you can rewrite the frequency as the light speed divided by wavelength. Why it helps? It does help because then this quite complicated expression reduces, it's still exact equation, to the difference in the wavelength, which is proportional to this one. So this is the form which is used quite frequently when you talk about the Compton phenomenon. Because here you see immediately that, uh, well, depending on cosine, but generally you, you uh, lose the energy, right? Because see, your wavelength is longer, so your energy is lower. So you lose energy. And it's not surprising because we actually assume that the electron was at rest. So now electrons, electron gain some energy. So at the expense of photon. So 
But for, for, for our uh, later purpose, this part of the equation is more convenient, actually. So then we can simplify this equation, assuming that, for example, cosine theta is equal to zero. Well, let's say this is instead of averaging over cosine. And then <coughs> you can also assume that the change of the energy, I mean, the difference between the new energy and all energy is small. If you assume that, you will get much simpler formula that the, ch the relative change of energy of the photon is equal minus the ratio of the photon initial photon energy to MEC square. So you see from this form immediately that if the initial energy of the photon is much, much lower than the rest um, rest energy of, of electron, the change is small. And of course, only under those, this uh, assumption, this formula is, is uh, valid. So photons here plus energy. This is not really very interesting for the rest of the, of the lecture, but We can now look at a more general situation. Why, why assume that electron is at, at rest? We can assume that electron is actually very fast. So there are two ways to do it. Either to start from the beginning and consider that both particles are uh, moving before the scattering or you can do the Lorentz transformation. So you, you say that you solve the problem for the mm, case of electron at rest. So if you have mm, electron which is moving, you can change the reference system. We are using special relativity. And then your electron is at, at rest. And then you have a ready formula. But going to this uh, uh, Changing this reference frame, you have to perform the transformation of energy. And then you have to actually perform this transformation two times, because first you have to go to the reference frame of the, of the moving electrons, and then you are interested in what happens in the observer's frame, in the old frame. So then you go back again. So for example, if the, the, the uh, gamma factor of the, of, the, of the electron is quite high, this Lorentz factor, then you have a huge amplification because you amplify by fa factor gamma changing the reference frame once, and then if you do it twice, you have gamma square. So then the photon can gain a lot of energy. And this is, the, for example, in, in uh, sources which are radio load, like that one, uh, wrong direction. I want to go back to this M87, where it was, M87, here. Those electrons producing simple from emission, they have Lorentz factors of order of 10 to 3, 10 to 4, 10 to 6, whatever. So then immediately after scattering, they create this band. And this is really hard X-ray emission, gamma ray emission, whatever you use. Huge energy. Now we go back to our problems. We'll concentrate uh, on thermal plasma, nevertheless, because as I told you, in the case of radio quiet sources, this X-ray emission doesn't go beyond 100 uh, kV, so this is not really spectacular. So this is another limit 
And if you uh, uh, assume that uh, your plasma is thermal, you can actually uh, calculate this energy gain in each scattering. And this is proportional to the temperature or actually to the 4 kT over the rest, rest mass energy of, of the photon. So if you have a thermal plasma and cool photons, then you gain energy by this fact. So now to have the general formula, we do as we frequently do in, in astronomy. We glue the two formula, two formulae. We did that during the first or second lecture when we had optically similar, optically thick medium. So we combined the previous formula. And you see that the relative change of the photon depends whether the photon energy is larger or lower than 4 kT, right? And you have a general formula. Everything here assumes that both those two factors are smaller than m, m e c squared. Otherwise, this uh, approximation does not work. So traditionally, uh, we call uh, we call Compton process when the when photon loses uh, energy and inverse Compton when photon gains energy. But we can be quite frequently in in this area where we have a balance between those two processes. So now, how this uh, uh, Comptonization works. Is it now promising to explain the shape of the of the spectrum? So we the, the setup we imagine is that here an observer waits for photons. We have a layer of, of optically thin hot plasma, let's say like a corona or whatever, and then we have a reservoir of, of cold photons. And those cold photons scatter a number of, of times. So at the beginning, photons will gain energy in each scattering, the same amount of energy, more or less. So if we start with soft photons, then we will have first scattering, second scattering, third scattering, whatever, and number of scatterings, right? But of course, photon can, cannot go to infinite energy because finally it will hit this barrier. And then more or less at kT, the process stops. So what forms here is that from monochromatic input photons, we create a kind of a power law. And the slope of this power law actually can be uh, estimated because it depends okay. it depends on the energy change in a single scattering that gives you this difference and then the normalization of the second third whatever order of scatterings depends on the optical depth so regulating optical depth and the plasma temperature, you can regulate the slope of the power law and you can always get a reasonable power law with this thermal cutoff. And this is actually what we needed. So using this kind of thermal contonization, we certainly can produce a spectrum like this, which looks like a power law here, and this cut off here. So it's a thermal, nice thermal uh, Comptonization. If we are interested in this Comptonization as a form of, of a cooling of this hot plasma, then of course the, the, this is the mean gain in uh, a single scattering and then the net effect will depend on the on the flux of radiation and the density of uh, of electrons 
And so it, it is also important, as I told you, both for the slope and for other uh, considerations to pay attention to the optical depth of the, of the Comptonizing zone. So there's optical depth, which we already introduced during the first or second lecture. And this is the Thomson cross-section density and the physical thickness of the, of the slab. We also talked about the number of scatterings, and then we had this bridging formula during the lecture two which tells us that if we have a really optically thin medium, then the number of scatterings is tall. And if we have uh, uh, optically thick medium, we have tall square number of scatterings. So this is this tau times tau plus one. It's a nice bridging formula. So for a given medium, we can estimate the net change in the photon energy introducing Compton parameter. This Compton parameter is the change of the energy in a single scattering given by this 4kT over NEC squared times tau times tau plus one. So now if we have, uh, uh, if we know the, the medium, if we know the temperature of the medium and the optical depth, we actually should check whether the value of this Com Compton parameter is appropriate. Because our derivations assumed that the net gain is not too large. So actually our derivations assume that this Compton parameter is smaller than one, can be close to one, but it shouldn't be much, much larger than one. And then uh, with the, the spectrum which forms is called unsaturated Compton spectrum. And it has this power law shape I was talking about. On the other hand, if you happen to exaggerate and your medium has Compton parameter much, much larger than one, the spectrum is not a power law. So this is the spectrum which I copied from uh, Rybicki and, and Lightman book. And then the spectrum looks quite different because first of all, since the number of scatterings is huge, most photons actually pile up at the maximum energy around 3 kT. So they, they form component which almost looks like a black body. But here, the assumption was that original source of photons was free, free emission. So those, some of those lower energy free free photons, they still didn't get to this. And then at the lowest frequency photons, for them, the, the cross-section for absorption is large. So the tail looks like a black body. And this is so-called saturated Comptonization spectrum. But in reality, we do not really see this kind of spectra. It's under discussion whether in, in uh, some operation disk atmosphere we see traces of saturated Comptonization or not. But basically, we see unsaturated Comptonization, this which was on the previous and this explains the spectra, X-ray spectra of galactic sources in their hard states and uh, X-ray emission in HGNs. Now, there is one more thing which I mentioned in, 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 in passing that if you, uh, if the mean energy of photons actually approaching approaches uh, kT or 4 kT, then photons neither gain nor lose energy. So you can actually have a situation that you have irradiated plasma. Usually this is very low density, quite distant plasma. 
you irradiate it, you heat it quite easily, and then the plasma temperature saturates because there is no gain nor, nor loss of energy. And this is the definition of the inverse Compton temperature. So the temperature of such plasma is just given by this relation. No gain, no loss. So if you have uh, an incident radiation, you can calculate this uh, mean energy by integrating the incident radiation. But calculating mean energy, the normalization of the flux cancels, right? So the result of this integration depends only on the shape of the spectrum and not on the normalization. So inverse Compton temperature is the same for any distance from, from the central source. Of course, it does not guarantee that you have this kind of medium because if the medium is too dense and you have absorption or whatever other processes, then of course this medium will not form. <laughs> But low density medium, yes, it will remain at uh, inverse Compton temperature. And as uh, uh, Begelman noticed already in 83, this can lead to formation of an outer corona. And what is more, you actually should check whether your inverse Compton temperature is smaller or larger than the virial temperature. If this inverse Compton temperature is smaller than virial temperature, then the plasma is gravitationally bound to the system and you have a kind of corona standing on the top of the disk or whatever. On the other hand, if you go to still higher distance, the temperature is the same, but the virial temperature goes down as one over R. So finally, you have a medium which is not gravitationally kept and you develop an inverse Compton wind. So such uh, corona wind is uh, certainly present in the outer parts of the galactic sources. Actually, if you see uh, eclipsing sources, if you want to explain them, you need to include this uh, accretion this corona, which is actually inverse Compton heated corona. It does not contribute much to the spectrum because all that forms very far away and it contains almost negligible amount of energy. But this, scatter, this corona scatters the central radiation. So then if you have an eclipse, because of the presence of the corona, you see scattered emission, which otherwise you wouldn't see. In the case of AGN, it's not really obvious if it applies anywhere. I mean, this particular, this corona wind uh, transition. On the other hand, the, the medium which is between the broad line region clouds, it's more or less at inverse Compton temperature. So now, we are, we again concentrate on, on the case of uh, medium, which has to be very close to the central part if it should, if it contains a significant fraction of volumetric luminosity. And that's a problem. Because, you know, Comptonization does not contain any traces about the dynamic or geometry. You have a power law and a cutoff, and you cannot do anything with that. Okay, you can try, but it's not easy. So there are various uh, suggestions to how this uh, medium looks uh, like, and uh, also the heating of this medium is not clear because the heating of this medium depends on, on geometry. And if you don't know geometry, you also don't know the, 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 the fitting mechanism. 
Yes. So for example, an, an example uh, is spherical inner uh, part or, or inner hot flow, whatever, and then the outer part of the disk. So in, if the if disk does not approach ISCO and then you need really hot flow here. So then the dissipation would be uh, in the form of, of viscous flow directly in the hot flow. But then you can also imagine that it's uh, the disk actually uh, extends down to ISCO and then you have magnetic flares. So then it would look like a solar corona. Those uh, flares can be much stronger because uh, differential rotation and rotation of the sun in any, in any way is much, much uh, slower than rotation in Keplerian disk. And then, of course, you can have a, a jet, for example, and then actually most of the emission can be from the inner jet. And we really don't know. This is um, my recent picture. A combination of all those, because I, I think this is really the reality and this is the problem. And if we quarrel, which of those previous three pictures is better than... It's not well posed problem, because I imagine that, well, if we have an accretion disk, then initially we also have some magnetic loops, some flares, but also we probably have a coronal flow from the outer parts. And this coronal flow probably finally forms an inner hot ADA flow. And then you have to form a jet. And there are now many arguments that in radio quiet sources, you also have a jet, only it is short and much more dissipative than in radio load sources. For, again, completely unknown reasons. So that there can be a dissipation here as well. And I think that just the geometry should be more or less uh, universal, but the position of the, of the cold disk uh, should be a strong function of Eddington ratio. If you have high Eddington ratio sources, your disk really approaches ISCO and the other components are relatively less important. If you have low Eddington ratio source, the, the cold disk proceeds and uh, maybe it does not form at all in some cases, like Sagittarius A star, for example. You don't have cold optically thin, thick uh, Keplerian disk in, in, in the center of, of, of the Milky Way. But this is just a fantasy, I mean. It's not a model. I don't have equations to, to give you which would describe this picture. It's just, you know, artistic activity. So those previous models are more convenient to some extent because then you, you can more easily formulate equations. But then the applicability is limited. So some hope to address this issue comes from the interaction between the cold disk and the hot flow. Because the advantage of cold disk is that it's not totally ionized. <laughs> and then this cold disk can be the source of emission lines, atomic features. And the advantage of atomic features is that if you have a narrow emission line and then the material moves, it's either Keplerian motion or anything, you can trace the velocity tracing using the Doppler effect. And then you at least know what this cold medium is doing. So for example, if, uh, if, if you have uh, just a medium, um, which uh, shows here that this is an example of absorption lines, but emission lines is the same. If the medium is uh, moves away from you, all lines are redshifted. If the medium 
moves towards you, it is blue shifted. If you have a ring, for example, then of course part of the ring moves towards you and part of the ring moves away from you. So you have both red shift and blue shift. So then actually you have a, something which looks like this, a horny thing. I didn't find the, uh, the plot from, from just the ring uh, uh, in the internet and I, I had no time to, 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 to calculate it. Uh, mm. But here you have an example, not just from, from the ring, but from a belt of a disc which extends from ISCO to only 15 Schwarzschild ready. So it's not whole disk. And it shows you exactly the same. This is in, in, calculated in Schwarzschild uh, geometry. If you do computations uh, using just Doppler uh, phenomenon and the situation is at larger distance, then those two horns I mentioned, they are identical. But of course, if you are close to the black hole, then you have additional gravitational shifts and the change of this uh, pattern changes. Of course, always you have the dependence on the viewing angle because you see the projected velocity. So if you have a top view, you actually would see only narrow line without really broadening. So broadening is the strongest if you have 60 degrees viewing angle and for the top view, it's almost a single line. So this, this gives a certain chance to have an insight into what is hot matter doing, but not, not direct because, uh, well, direct would be uh, from checking, for example, if, if we can have hot medium and cold medium in, uh, in pressure ba balance, but, but we know we can. This is never a problem. So it, it's, it's enough to say that uh, hot medium is lower than CT medium, but uh, uh, with higher temperature and you can always create uh, a balance. And even if we include uh, thermal conduction, this is not really a unique uh, way to explain how the hot medium forms. So we have to really observationally rely on this way. So you assume something about hot irradiating medium, and then you predict the shape of the line which forms in a Keplerian disk. So indeed, if you look at this part of the spectrum more closely, this X-ray part, it contains narrow emission line, which is related to iron. This is this K alpha line. And there is also Compton Ham, which we will mention later. And well, in, in reality, this line is actually visible. It's not well visible when you plot the whole spectrum, but if you subtract the continuum and plot only what remains, here you see indeed very broad emission line and then you can try to model this line and then to guess what this hot medium is, is doing. So one, uh, one word about how this uh, iron line uh, forms more or less all things form in a similar way. Imagine that we have a neutral iron atom. You see this is very complicated uh, atom. And there is an X-ray emission which approaches this neutral iron atom. And X-ray emission, of course, can penetrate very deeply. 
and binding it if this energy is, is significantly larger than binding energy of the inner electron, then this electron can be removed from the atom. This is the scale. This is the usual uh, naming of, of uh, orbits around an atom K, L, M for, for an ion. So an empty space forms here. And then we some probability an electron which is on L orbit will jump into K orbit. But now you have a, a specific energy difference. So this jump corresponds to the emission of uh, a photon, K alpha photon of specific uh, energy. And this energy for neutral uh, iron is 6.4 kV. It's not that the formation of this line is very efficient because in many cases, this is a very complex uh, atom. So those electrons can somehow rearrange themselves and actually all what is finally emitted is an electron or gel electron. So you have only 20 something percent of the probability of, of uh, K alpha emission, but nevertheless, this is still very strong uh, a line observed in X-rays and there are not that many lines in that part of the spectrum. And then in addition, the abundance of iron is quite large. So this is why this line is the most convenient to observe in X-rays. And one in, in, interesting uh, thing which comes out from studying uh, this K-alpha line is that recently well, not very recently, this is Cara et al. a few years ago. A compilation of different uh, determinations. People were able to measure the time delay between the continuum and K alpha line. So here is the, the time lag, and here is the black hole mass because that was done for several objects. And what they marked here is the distance of one RG and here is six RG. So K alpha line, at least in those sources, forms really very, very close to the nucleus. And it also suggests that the source of the radiation is also quite close to the nucleus because otherwise the time delay would not be measured. So everything is really dramatically com compact, right? A few RG. In addition, indeed, if you look at the shape of this K alpha line, indeed, it looks, uh, it is consistent, at least in, selectic so in selected sources, with the Keplerian motion of, of the disk. And because this Keplerian motion of the disk depends in general, if you use rotating black hole, depends on the spin, you can try to measure the black hole spin using the shape of K-alpha line. So this is an older example, really many, many years old from Japanese satellite ASCA. This is XMM new star data. Honestly, it's not, not much better, right? So I think we have to really wait till uh, Athena is flying to get much, much better spectra. If the same line is seen in a galactic sources. So the same argument applies here. You see the same line or excess about the power law. So you see, if you look at the whole spectrum, this line is not really impressive. This is this tiny feature here, right? You see that. But if you if you show it in this way, yes, you see 
this is actually uh, a source containing a neutron star. So in the case of the neutron star, you also have similar setup, this very broad uh, K alpha line and relatively compact uh, X-ray emitting uh, region. On the other hand, it's not true that uh, this broad line, K alpha line, is seen in all, all sources. It's not. And this was why I said for low Eddington ratio sources that this recedes, and then we do not see broad K alpha line. For example, in NGC 5548, we don't have broad K alpha line. So more about the geometry. In recent uh, paper uh, based on uh, NICER satellite, this is relatively new thing, which is well, satellite. It is an, an instrument sitting on the International Space Station, but it's still small satellite. So this is why the, the signal to noise ratio is not that fantastic. But the time resolution is, is nice, and they observe the galactic source, and the galactic sources, they have always roughly two orders of magnitude better countries, because they are much, much closer. So they are more easy, easy to observe. And she was uh, uh, studying the, the K-alpha line shape during the outburst of the source, which lasted uh, 100 days, whatever. And this is the shape of the, of the line. And it clearly changes during the outburst. So from this change of the outburst, they conclude in this paper that originally this hot uh, source of emission was kind of larger, higher, and then it slowly, slowly shrinked and approached really the, the, the Keplerian disk at the end of the of the outbursts. So it is possible to draw some conclusions about this hot emitting region. Here it is in this form of base jet or whatever, something which is levitating along the symmetry axis for whatever reason. On the other hand, it's not that conclusive. This is a kind of compilation of the results for, of the location of the inner disk radius as a function of Eddington ratio for a single source, but from different autos. So here, this this paper, whatever was this paper, uh, Garcia et al. They argue that they are really quite close to ISCO here in this. But for the same Eddington ratio, some other guys, they are at 100. It's not that I fully understand. Probably both sides are cheating somehow, whatever, because, uh, you know, this is actually a, a, a plot from, from this paper, and they claim that if they draw K alpha line for two cases, one is with the disk at ISCO, and the other case is at 100, they have the same K alpha line shape. Honestly, if you ask me why, I don't know. It, it's not. But they, 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 they say that using their software, and this is this miracle expression, their software, then changing the abundance by a factor of five, they get more or less the same result. So then you actually also don't know whether your hot plasma is filling the remaining part, like 100 RG, or it's this stupid levitating thing on the <clears throat> symmetry axis. You just don't know. This is a paper which is uh, four years old, 
But uh, during the, the recent conference I attended, they still quarrel about it. I, I just didn't find the most recent paper. So it's difficult. It's somehow inherently difficult. By the way, here they also use the uh, Compton hump, which didn't help them much. So a few words about the uh, Compton hump. Because it, it seems like it, it will solve all these problems, but somehow not quite. So what is this Compton hump? Let's imagine that we have uh, hard x-rays. Those are this, the primary hard x-rays. And they fall onto abrasion disk, plane, whatever called. Then, of course, I told you that the iron line will be formed. The iron line forms through absorption. But apart from absorption, significant fraction of photons will be just scattered. So we can imagine schematically that this is the incident power law, and then you have expected elastic scattering component. On the other hand, this scattered component indeed forms, but it does not form in such way. Because if you look at lower energies, here you see a lot of emission lines. That also suggests you that absorption is much stronger. So then the probability of reflection here will be much lower. So actually, there will be less reflection than you expect from elastic scattering. At high uh, energies, I mentioned to you that uh, there are quantum effects. There is a change in the cross-section. So Klein-Nishina cross-sections should be used. That cross-section is smaller. So that causes that the, that the photon enters the material much more deeply. Then it's energetic photons, so it, it loses a lot of energy. When it loses energy, the cross-section rises, and it cannot get out. So this is why here also the scattering part bends. As a result, instead of another power law just lower, you have a something which is bent. And this is this Compton hump which peaks more or less at about 2030 KD. And of course, it's also a subject of the relativistic smearing if it comes from, from a Keplerian disk. So there, it, it seems like having data in this part will solve all the problems uh -uh, the wrong direction. But somehow here in this paper, they have some data, I guess, in this part. But I don't know. Again, still, it's not conclusive enough. So we didn't talk much about uh, heating of this X-ray plasma because we don't have geometry. And if we don't have geometry, we cannot decide properly on, on the heating. I, I think we, we have a list of possibilities. That's not a problem, but which one is actually working? So if we have a, a hot in a flow, certainly viscous heating is the, the, the natural option. So then it works like in, in the case of standard uh, accretion disk, only the spectral uh, shape will be different. And we will go to those uh, models during one of the of the future mm, lectures. Uh, for the corona above the disk, of course, magnetic uh, heating would be appropriate, uh, like in the in the solar corona. But they, as for details, they 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 still. Uh, discuss the, the issue for the solar corona, whether those are magnetosonic waves or something else or whatever. Uh, of course, shocks and magnetic field reconnection that, that always can, can happen. And this is, you, you mentioned the spin, right? 
well, if, if, if there is really spin uh, jet coupling, then it might be a suggestion that actually this blunt force Nyack mechanism is, is, is at work. On the other hand, I will not really discuss uh, blunt force Nyack mechanism because uh, I don't think I, I, I fully understand that. And I remember that well, many years ago when it became fashionable, I first went to the conference and I, I met uh, Blantford and I asked him how this really mechanism works and he told me to talk to Znajek. And then on another conference, I met Znajek, he's actually Polish guy, so that was easy to talk to him, but he told me to talk to Blantford. <laughs> At that time I stopped <laughs> reading those papers, but okay, maybe it works, maybe it works. So one, one final comment, whether you have a, one heating or another, if you have a thermal plasma, quite compact, like this lamp post, whatever, hanging above the symmetry axis, you have to start to worry about one more thing, namely already in, in, in 70s, uh, Gina Bisnovati Kogan discussed that, that you have a maximum temperature for this kind of uh, plasma ball that was later studied by, by Swanson. Because if you, if you release too, too much energy in a compact region, you have a lot of gamma ray photons and then you have gamma gamma photon collision and then you finally produce pairs, electron positron pairs and they will cool the medium, certainly below the rest, rest energy of the electron. So that was known since many years, but what, what Fabian did a couple of years ago uh, was to confront this old data with uh, observation. So here he, he plotted this uh, compactness parameter which, well, if you have very compact things, then it's compact, right? It, here, this is the temperature measured in MAEC square. So this temperature corresponds to, to electron rest energy. And for different geometries, he had some kind of lines. And if the source is above, then it should be dominated by pair production. If it is below, then it does not have to be dominated by pair production. So in the case of slab, we have an impression that it, we are kind of at the limit of pair production. On the other hand, Fabian himself always draws his corona spherical. In that case, this is a sphere. So we are well below and that would mean that uh, just Comptonization is sufficient enough to cool the plasma and we don't need per creation. We don't have direct arguments for the presence of, of pairs because they, they could annihilate, they could produce um, annihilation line, but that was not measured in galactic sources. There was one claim many, many, many years ago by Russians using an old satellite, but then the data were never public and that was never confirmed. So we don't know, but we are not, not too far from that. And anyway, this is the summary. And as, as I told you, the summary is not conclusive. We know a lot of, of pieces, like Comptonization. Yes, we can do Comptonization. We can do a lot of Comptonization, but then it does not solve our problem of geometry of the plasma. It does not solve our mechanism of hot heating of this hot plasma. And during the next, next lecture, we will talk about more problems. So I think easy times are over. <laughs> and there is no homework today.
because I didn't invent anything which can be so easily. Unless, of course, you will have answer to the problem of geometry of the whole hot plasma for you know next week. Then I would be happy. Okay, thank you. Question. So how is this uh, the base of the corona related with the discount, the jet emission? Because as we can see from that plot, if we increase, start to increase the angle ratio, then the disk would start to recede the weight, you know, come come back and receive the weight, depending on how we change the Eddington ratio. If we so, change the Eddington ratio, that also may mean that this kind of shock which forms at the jet basis is with painter. <laughs> Shouldn't that also mean that it's not only increasing in size, but also moving the base itself? Which means that key alpha position. It's not obvious. The key alpha position could also change, which then other authors actually see. Yeah, but somehow this key alpha shape is not giving you uniformly everything. You know, if you take one author, one software, one data set, yes, you have firm trend. But then if you mix authors, then it's not different, different epochs, probably the data. No, it's a it's 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 a problem of, of, of the approach to modeling. This is the real problem. Models are, are reprocessing models are not uh, unique. And they are not too sensitive because finally you, you create uh, your line here. But the source of, of, of uh, photons, in, in the case of spectrum, it does not enter. If you do time-resolved things, you can see some things, but then you lose uh, spectral information because then you are uh, limited by the number of photons. That's the problem. I think with, with Athena, more more things will be will be possible because then really time resolved spectroscopy will be possible. But for the moment, for example, uh, Barbara is doing some time resolved spect spectroscopy, so she has also short time delays. But then you don't con have the full spectra information at the same time because you have to average over many epochs but folding with frequency instead of with spectrum. So we don't know. We really don't know. More questions? Remote people are probably asleep <laughs> by now. Okay, if no question, then it's the end of the lecture. Thank you. That's all right. Wydrożeniowych, ja akurat mam dużo pracy w ostatnim miesiące. Myślę, czy ewentualnie mógłbym to oddać później, no żeby się. Można, oczywiście. To jest tylko tak, że no jak ktoś chce mieć formalnie zaliczenie, to ja muszę mieć formalnie tę pracę. Więc one mogą być, że tak powiem, pod koniec sesji, na początku lutego, czy kiedyś po lutego. Proszę się jeszcze też tym jakoś przyspieszę, bo na razie nie rozciągnę tego czasu. No ja rozumiem, że pan ma duże obowiązki. Pan jest tym człowiekiem z. Z Polskiej Agencji. No, z Polskiej Agencji. No taka to ja rozumiem, że pan ma cały etap na prawdę tam, a nie. So, I get the Dobrze. ten, gdzie się tu usuwa ten. O, tu jest. Save, bo zapomniałam to zrobić. Ten to very bad, że tak powiem. 
A, do 50%. Dokładnie, tak, dokładnie, tak, tak, dokładnie tak. Więc y, bardziej mi chodzi o sposób odliczania tego, tak? Ja bym po prostu mając tą formułę na tym dali się wkład z, z jakąś tam powierzchnią. No, z powierzchnią. Tak, tak, Właśnie tak, to jest ważne, tak, żeby tak, było z powierzchnią. Tak, tak, tak. tak, tak. no. I tu wychodzi taki średnio przyjemny wynik. Analityczną formułę. A to się nie da na to. Nie da się. A, nie. To okay. trzeba rzeczywiście wrzucić w jakimś I ile tu było tak zbyt Nie wiem, kilka wyników i... No około 10, nie pamiętam, 12 okay. bardziej okay. nawet nie da. Okay. Ale to rzeczywiście trzeba już włożyć okay. ostateczne, Dobra. czyli całka się liczy analitycznie, a... Są a I have to change the, oh, you can open. Uh, which one uh, is? Yeah, but it's on the screen. Ah, uh, I, mean, I think one. it's the... Uh, mm. oh, this eight. Yeah, it's more... It's control and whatever. Yeah, yeah, but I... Here it is. For the first, I can use the reverberation. Yes. But which lines are used to? For Taurus continuum. It is continuum. Only continuum. Only continuum. Near infrared continuum. Okay, so the continuum is shifted. I mean, it's delayed. But but compared to what? I mean, we have some reference. Com uh, in comparison to, to, to optical, v -band. Okay, so, so you can compare two microns and v -band. And this is what you calculate. Okay, and, and, for, and then you want to focus on you know, the or close, and then he, you change to HP. Yes. But HP compared to what? Okay, again, v -band. No less. Ah, oh, 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 so this is more convenient because this is, has less uh, contamination by, by emission lines, but in the case of Octavus, it does not So they, they, so here for, for H beta we compare this to H beta line. But in the case of Octavus, we uh, compare this to microns. You do just photometry, you don't need spectroscopy. But you need a longer, still longer observations. Do we have only the observation? Get, get, uh, well, from, from the shape of, uh, of 
have this virial factor, right? Yes. You have this black hole mass, mm -hmm. equal, and this is this virial factor. And then you have full uh, half maximum, right? Mm -hmm. Square and uh, what? Luminosity. Whatever. Mm -hmm. There is something here. Radius, radius, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes. It is radius here, then it's luminosity is yes. on the one there. But this 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 scaling frequently is taken from MC annihilation. Not not always. For example, this uh, rest uh, people have different than may yeah. May and stable. Yes. That was taken from from syntax. I'm not sure if they 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 still needed some additional normalization on average or not? I don't remember. Did they have like a, oh, that's yes. why they always normalize with the central peak of the line, depending upon which line you're taking for the measurement, the F factor will change. Because you always have this, this factor, right? Because in, from, from the force you begin and over. <laughs> R, right, is equal D square, right? This is the, the definition of the Keplerian motion. But here you have also hidden this uh, sign or whatever. And this is, let's say, sign, certain function. So, for example, if you have time delay, you can take that directly from time delay. But now here for for the velocity, you can take either full risk of maximum or, for example, sigma, and it's not quite the same. And then you have this issue. But apart from that, you are ready to calculate the black hole mass. But, okay, so, yeah? so the main point of my question is that if we get this R from time delay, yes. so this, can, this cannot be the clumps, I mean the clouds, that are very uh, far from this. But if they say is hidden somewhere here, right? They roughly approximate a fifth second period because there's also a factor which is the velocity ratio between the So normally all is hidden here. Mm -hmm. Of course, mm -hmm. if, you, if you develop a whole 3D image, mm -hmm. then, then you don't need this stuff. Then you should do that numerically. This is, for example, how some people do in Monte Carlo. They they do time delays without uh, postulating this. So they have this broad line region in the form of, of many clouds, right? And they do Monte Carlo. And they assume here certain irradiation flux, and then reprocessing. They calculate by by integration this reprocessing. So they have initial light curve, right? And then resulting uh, line intensity plus shape. And then to 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 to, to reproduce. Uh, line light curve with proper delay, they, then they, they take the, all this uh, geometry into account. But this is the theory, I mean, this is the theory. observation. But then you observation. You so this is a theory, but then they combine with observed uh, light curve. Because they, they, they do Monte Carlo, so they rearrange things, they check if they have proper time delay, like in the data. They have actually separate uh, uh, initial light curve and then this. So they, they have a continuum light curve, 
they have high intensity, and I think they collect also. Uh, they, they they look at the light. So they work with the data because this is how they model also. So this is simple because this is kind of an input. But this is output from the new code. So for example, uh, I think Pankos was doing that. 2014. Yes, and also Chinese guys are doing that. Yang no me. So they, they do this kind of thing. But they assume arbitrary uh, distribution in the sense of the power law dependence of radius, height, whatever. So your approach is from the other side to, to, to first find what is the physical distribution. When, when, when we are ready with physical distribution, yes, you can try also this kind of modeling. That's kind of the next step. They have just parametric description of this model. This, so then the number of clouds is the function of radius and that theta are in certain form. But then they model the, the data. But this is more advanced, and this is not that everybody is doing that. And this is only for sources which which have this uh, reverberation monitoring, right? If you don't have reverberation monitoring, you are using simple relations like like here. It is. So for a specific source, if you do reverberation mapping uh, several times, we get different time delay? Well, this, this uh, rarely happens because, for example, for this uh, quasar we do monitoring, we spend six years on deriving one time delay. So I'm not sure when we will have uh, the next determination of during my life, right? Uh, on the other hand, so there is only one source which certainly has many time delays, and this is NGC 5548, because there you need one year to get time delay. And that source has at least uh, 15 epochs. And this time delay is different. And it varies from two days. For 20 days. But for, for most sources, you, you just do this monitoring for six years and you know. I cannot write a, a, a proposal that I need still 18 years of observations because I want to, to have three epochs more. So for, for nearby uh, low luminosity sources you can try. <coughs> I think Chinese may have two time delays for some of their sources. But usually it's not. It's just one done, done once and that's it. You never go to the same source again. Because of uh, question was that if we consider the maximum point of, of mm -hmm. from the surface of the disk to produce the maximum H beta points, then we focus on them, then... Uh, it's a kind of simplification. Basically, you, you would have to integrate over the whole distribution, right? But we are not yet sure that our whole distribution is, is uh, well determined. So this is why I try to simplify and instead of integration to use two points, right? Mm -hmm.
of two points should show some trend, but it's not the same as calculating the whole integral. You would have to assume that you have all those clouds distributed and then time delay for each of those clouds will be different. So photon which, which is emitted at the same time here will come after this uh, processing at different uh, times. So it, this would give uh, this kind of uh, green function or <coughs> I was thinking that this uh, IDLR for location IDLR is uh, actually is related to this Where you have the distant part of the close part, and use this data. I mean, we get the, the the time delay from the profiles, and then we put it here, okay. and then we say that the uh, radius or the location of VLR is this, and then we put it here. Okay. However, for example, if if this is the black hole and this is the disk, okay, and uh, uh, for example. The observer is here, okay, and <coughs> this this uh, configuration produces a, a, a continuum and, and a shift uh, mm -hmm. for the H beta, and then we get a time delay in the profiles, and uh, from the profiles uh, we can find the RBLR, okay. But what we what we uh, Point here is is this? I mean, you know, what I'm yeah, because this, this time delay is different for every cloud. Right? Yeah. But from each profile, we get just one time delay. Yeah. Now for each cloud, and if if you have only a, a profile, then you assume that it's something representative. Because if, if you think about clouds, then for every cloud, you will have a different time delay. So the theta factor is included, right? Yeah. The so we will have different phase and we get different clouds. But just tell me that we have a profile of an agent equator, and then it, it gives us a continuum profile. And, no, um, but, but the line, line profile does not give you the information about the distribution of clouds, right? If you if you have the stupid Lorentzian profile, you cannot tell how clouds are actually situated, not, not unique. One, one example, cloud. For example, you have a profile of. of uh, well, the spectral uh, profile or time profile? Maybe let's specify first. Yes, spectral. So, spectral uh, profile is the, the, just this Lorentzian shape. But then I cannot tell you. Uh, so, you have uh, in, in Lorentzian shape, you have different uh, photons, right? This is this Lorentzian shape. But then I'm not sure from which place this photon comes. Because actually, because this, this photon, it, it, there is even no unique relation that this photon will come from a specific place because here you have 3D and here you have a sort of 1D projection, right? So you cannot invert that to get 3D automatically. Always you can reverse. I mean, from, from this, you so this is not true. If you have 3D distribution, then you can get the line profile. But not the other way around. Because you know. And in the other case, that's not this. Spectral will give you the full width. That should be the timing profile, which will give you the delays, and that's how you get the radius. But that's still going for one cloud. 
So if you have one cloud, then one cloud gives you just something like that, right? This is one cloud. Let's say this is rest lambda. One cloud will give you just one lambda. So for a, for a specific source, uh, we have just, for example, for a specific source, we have different uh, profiles, either this one or this one. We have different profiles or just one profile. And if this profile if, gives us just well, one- Well, depends on the situation. Or, or, if you, well, if, if, uh, if you have monitoring, and not very long, then you have one profile. Basically, for, yeah, because for, for, for our quasar, the changes in in uh, in the line shape are, are small. I do not see any difference. So this is why why we tried also to do this LNS uh, profile, but nothing comes out. So profile does not change. All what changes is a bit normalization. Okay. So, for, for so in this, source, we have formally, uh, let's say, 25 source, uh, 25 observations, but they look kind of identical. And so this only gives us just one value for the time delay or, or, or location of both One value of the time delay. This is what we go to with 1,000 days. Okay. So from this, we can get just one value for the location of both region. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this uh, I will discuss it more with you tomorrow. Uh-huh. Okay. okay. This I wanted to get to it. Uh-huh. Okay, I can close.